Hi, welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by me, Janine Turner, and Kathy Gillespie, with students, Dakari Chapman, and me, Tova Kaplan. Join us as we discuss hot topic issues with constitutional experts. It's sponsored by Constituting America. I'm Janine Turner. I'm an actress by trade. You can find out all about that at JaneneTurner.com. But I care passionately about our country and our founding documents. And I am the founder of Constituting America. And I'm co-president with Kathy Gillespie. So welcome. We love these constitutional chats. It's just really, I love them. I learned so much. Um, and today, our special team, Jeanette Cranach. Jeanette Cranach is our director of operations. And she is a former school teacher, a wonderful person. And she does so much to bring constitutional, constituting America to life. And she will book a speech that I can give to your team, your classroom, your homeschool group, your Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. She's your key person. And you can go to the website to the, where it says George Washington Speaking Initiative and click on book a speech and you will get Jeanette Cranach. Jeanette Cranach, say hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome. And I'd love to welcome our special guest. It's such an honor to have you with us today, sir. And uh, thank you to everyone who's here today. And I have my George Washington picture behind me today to remind you to click on the George Washington speak to, speaking initiative. Uh, I live in Mount Vernon and all of us in Mount Vernon are big George Washington fans. So he's with us wherever, where, whatever we're doing, wherever we go, our first president is always first and foremost in the lesson. Remember that to your students. There you go, there you go. And I'm supposedly related to George Washington. And you asked me how I had no children. <laughs> I'm related through my mother's side to his grandfather. Is that wow. not cool? Yeah. Um, okay. So, so when I sat in his pew and it said George Washington's pew, I, before I even knew I was related, I felt something. I felt George Washington was with me. Okay, <laughs> Lisa. Also, I want to thank our sponsors. Don't let me forget. Lisa, I'm going to introduce you. Lisa is our millennial. We're so excited to have Millennial Z Generations on our team. And she is our director of media. So she's a fabulous, fabulous editor as well. Very talented. You're going to see her name in lights someday, accepting an Academy Award. Hi, Lisa Williams. Hi, Janine. Thank you. I don't know that they let the editor accept the Academy Award, but I appreciate it. Um, yes, there's a best editing category. Thank you. You win for best editing and you get to go up and accept your award. That's one of the pre-show ones, but... <laughs> no, it's not. No, no, it's not. You don't, watch the, you don't even watch the Oscars. I guess a little more closely. Um, if you guys want to watch this or any of our other podcasts, um, we do put them all up on, on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts. There's a full archive on our website if you want to see any of our previous episodes. Um, and thanks for being here today. We're excited. Yes, and we do have articles one, two, three, four, five. Um, that we have, we've done these shows. If you want to uh, watch those shows, as many, so many other really interesting shows. Okay, I do want to thank our sponsors very quickly before we get to our last but not least very brilliant special guest. We would like to thank today's sponsor, Mr. and Mrs. David Norcross. David and his wife Lori are great Americans. Do we have a picture of them? No, I guess you just get to see me read it then. Uh, David and his wife Lori are great Americans and have been so active in promoting constituting constitutional education in a variety of ways over the years. So he's a, David is a member of the Federal Society and the Republican National Lawyers Association and has been a leader in national and local politics for many years. So David and Lori Norcross, we thank you so very much. And I've met y'all, i met y'all in a minute couple of years ago was that when it was um in washington dc so thank you for your support of constituting america and thank you for sponsoring today if you'd like to sponsor there's a little button for that too somewhere on the website but thanks for sponsoring today so much okay are you ready drum roll please i would like to introduce our very very special guest really truly truly it is an honor to have him um today our very special guest is the honorable our general paul clement former Solic Solicitor General of the United States. Paul Clement is a partner in the Washington DC office of Kirkland and Ellis LLP. Paul served as the 43rd Solicitor General of the United States 
from June 2005 until June 2008. Before that, he served as acting solicitor general for nearly a year and as principal deputy solicitor general for over three years. What dedication to his country he has really served our country. Now, listen to this. Paul has argued over 100 cases before the Supreme Court. 100! Since 2000, Paul has argued more Supreme Court cases than any lawyer in or out of government. Wow, that's amazing. He represents clients in the Supreme Court and in federal and state appellate courts. Lectures at George Washington, at Georgetown, not George Washington, Georgetown, big difference, university where he has taught since 1998. Paul also serves as a senior fellow of the Georgetown Law Center's Supreme Court Institute. Wow, arguing more Supreme Court cases than any lawyer in and out of government until the, until the year 2000, over 100 cases. And all this, Solicitor General, you're just amazing. General, General Clement, welcome to the show. Thank you, it's great to be on the show. Um, very excited. I was happy to talk okay, about the Constitution. Thing, well, good, and the first thing I want you to explain to our middle school students and whatnot, what a Solicitor General does and is in the government. Sure, happy to. The Solicitor General is not the person that puts the warning on tobacco products. Um, the Solicitor General instead is the person who argues in the Supreme Court on behalf of the entire federal government. So it could be the president that gets sued, it could be the Secretary of Agriculture, it could be the Federal Communications Commission, doesn't really matter. if. A part of the federal government is sued and the case goes to the Supreme Court, the Solicitor General essentially handles the case for the government. Wow, that's really impressive. Can you give us a recent one? Give us one that you did in 2000 and then a recent one that's been under, say, the Trump administration. Sure. So, um, you know, I, when I was in, in the Solicitor General's office, um, we argued, you know, a whole bunch of cases, but about a decade ago, um, we argued the big constitutional challenge to the campaign finance laws, uh, the so-called mm. McCain-Feingold laws that just revamped all of the rules for making contributions to elections and things like that. So topical of what's going on in the country right now. And that was challenged on First Amendment grounds, and we defended that. Um, now that I'm you know, not part of the government, um, you know, I'm arguing oftentimes with the government, sometimes against the government, one of the cases I argued last term involved whether or not the federal government had to pay the health insurers who provided health insurance on the exchanges as part of the Affordable Care Act, because under the statute, they were supposed to be reimbursed for part of their losses, but Congress decided it didn't want to appropriate any money for that. And so there was an obligation of the United States and no money to pay it, which Oddly, is a transition to Article 6 of the Constitution, but we'll get to that in a minute. In any event, the Supreme Court case was about whether the federal government had to pay that debt, uh, and the court ruled eight to one that the federal government had to pay the, the debt. And it was a quite sizable debt, so that was, a, that was an important case. Wow, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in there and watch you do that. Um, okay, well, so what do you want to start? Tell us about Article 6 and 7. Sure. I mean, you know, you can Articles. think of these, you can see, you can think of these as sort of maybe like the sleeper clauses in the Constitution. They're not the ones that set up one of the three branches of government. They're not one that tells you how to amend the Constitution, which is obviously important, but they're, they're actually pretty important. And I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the two articles, and then we can take it from there. But uh, we'll start with Article 6, obviously, and Article 6 has uh, three different clauses, um, and each one covers a slightly different topic. I think it's probably fair to say that Article 6 is where the framers put important provisions in the Constitution that they didn't know where else to put. It's kind of like the miscellaneous you know, uh, file. But the first thing they address, and that's, this is the one that's kind of related to the case I argued uh, just a couple of months ago, is they wanted to have a clause that made clear that when they came up with this new federal government that they were constituting, that it would assume all of the debts and obligations of the Continental Congress and the Articles of Confederation. Because at that point, because of the Revolutionary War, 
Uh, the federal government, this new government owed a lot of people, including some foreign governments, a bunch of money. And so it was very important to the framers to signal to those foreign governments uh, that we're going we're gonna to honor our debts. We're not doing this as some kind of like bankruptcy, uh, liquidation or restructuring. We are going to honor all our debts. So that's the first clause of uh, Article 6. The second clause, probably the one that's most important today, is called the Supremacy Clause. And it makes clear that the federal laws passed by the new uh, created Congress and the Constitution itself and any treaties that are negotiated by this new federal government are the supreme law of the land. And most importantly, that they take precedence over any state laws that conflict with them. So if the state of New York passes a law that says one thing, and the new Congress passes a law that says, no, not so fast. Um, it's different. It's a kind of a, a, a rule that says the federal government's rule uh, takes effect, takes precedent. So that's the second clause. The third clause, um, which is, seems like a detail, but it's more important than you think, um, is the so-called oath clause. And it specifies that all of the officers of the federal government but interestingly, also all of the officers of the several states, so state government officers as well, have to take an oath uh, to the new constitution, that they will support and mm -hmm. defend this new constitution. Um, and so that's, mm -hmm. that, that's important. Um, and it also um, says that we're not going to have any religious tests for service in the federal government. So if you go all the way back mm -hmm. to the framing, some of the 13 original states did have official religions in the state and did have some requirements in their state constitution that said that if you wanted to support, if you wanted to play a role in that state government, you had to be a Christian or a Protestant or something like that. Mm -hmm. And right from the beginning, the federal government said, we're not going to have that at the federal level. And then that brings us to Article 7 which is last, but you know, by no means not least, because this is where the framers probably did um, the thing that is kind of the most kind of radical in a sense, because they specified that the constitution would take effect if it were ratified by the people in nine of the 13 states, the nine of the 13 original colonies, if you will. And the reason that's kind of radical is because the framers were sent to Philadelphia under the auspices of the uh, sort of uh, of the of the of the Congress under the Articles, so the Articles of Confederation Congress um, sent you know authorized all of this constitutional convention in Philadelphia with an eye to revising the Articles of Confederation, and in order to revise the Article of Confederation under the confederation document itself you were supposed to have a unanimous vote of all of the states so the you know the articles of confederation can only really be amended by unanimous amendment and here in this last article of the new constitution the framers pretty boldly say nine states is enough if, if we can get nine states to ratify this we're going to call it the new government the new constitution so even though the framers were sent to Philadelphia to revise and improve on the Articles of Confederation, kind of on their own motion in Article 7, they decide, all right, we're going to actually, you know, part of the problem with the Articles of Confederation is you can't do anything unless every state in the, in the Union agrees, and that's proven really impractical. So we're going to say the new Constitution can take effect as long as nine states, and in fact, the people of nine states end up ratifying it. Well, you know, that sounds like it's a grab bag, but it's really, truly fascinating. And I know the Supremacy Clause is the one thing we, we should focus on, but I'm, I am a history buff, you know, and, and I think it's two, two aspects are, are interesting to me. One is, first, the fact that they were sent to revise the Articles of Confederation. And we, we've heard this rumor of a guest who had a 
uh, a book that a friend, another scholar wrote that said that actually they did have permission to sort of redo the drastic things that they did. Because I know when it comes to a, when people are talking about a convention of states, people are freaked out about that. Because I said, look what happens to the, con what happened to the articles, you know, to, when, the, when they wrote the constitution. But there's this other scholar that says, no, wait a minute, they, they did have approval. Because I, I think the convention of states, they say the state legislatures that are sent will have specific things to work on. And this scholar is saying, no, they, they did have permission to, to revise. So I guess that's the term, the revise. I mean, did, did the founding fathers really think they revised the Articles of Confederation or do they think that it was completely transformed? Well, I, I think they thought they, I mean, they may have been sent there to revise, but I think by the time they were done, I think they felt like, you know, the way to revise this was to just, you know, essentially replace. And, you mm -hmm. know, I certainly, you know, I, I, I respect, you know, one of the great things about history is you can debate these things and you can have sort of slightly revisionist views of kind of history. And I'm sure it's arguable, but I, I do think that, you know, it, the, probably the conventional view is that their express authorization to go to Philadelphia was more limited. And to me, the best evidence of that is if they were really revising the Articles of Confederation, I'm not sure how they could get away with saying nine, nine votes is enough, you know, nine states mm -hmm, is enough. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, because the Articles of Confederation was quite clear, you needed unanimous consent to have an amendment to the Articles of Confederation. And that's and I think, something you know, that really didn't, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, somebody should double check me on this, but I, but I think that's, you know, I don't think the Articles of Confederation was ever successfully amended because it required unanimity. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and, and I think what, you know, what, and, and maybe this is the argument, I haven't read the kind of historical sort of paper on it, but, you know, I think when the framers were there, they were supposed to revise the Articles of Confederation to make it more workable. And one of the things they concluded is part of what makes it not work is that it's almost impossible to amend. And so, you know, the, I, I suppose, you know, as, as a lawyer, I could argue, well, you know, all they did was revise because they were told to, you know, address its imperfections. And one of the ways, one of the imperfections was the process of amendment. So they came up with something completely different. But I think probably the simpler argument is, boy, they realized that the Articles of Confederation just needed to go, um, you know, and, and so I think you could, it's a little like asking somebody to come and sort of, you know, kind of repair something on your house and you leave for a week and you come back and there's a whole new house there. Um, you know. Yeah, yeah, well see, it, it, not, to get, not to get on that for too long because we talked about that yeah. last week, but, but I do think that, um, that, that not, that to have a, and I, Kathleen, Lisa, I know you want to tell me something, so I know, that the unanimous aspect of, of they, that's why they couldn't get anything done. They, they couldn't get anyone, they couldn't get everyone to agree with you and with, you know, everyone to, to unite in that sort of way. And that's, we almost lost the Declaration of Independence because of that very reason. So that was cer cer certainly something that needed to be changed. Well, I want to toss this over to the others for questions, but I do th also want to touch on the, what seems like sort of a, a given to us today, but that's the faith aspect. And, you know, it, throughout history, the, the way that, that, the, that the, the, the bishops, and, and all had come in and really ruled the kings and, and all of the, you know, that was, that was something that, that hindered government quite a bit, but also, um, or influenced government. But also, I, I think that the, the reality that, uh, you know, there were different types of religions and they didn't want one particular, I think they were afraid of one particular and probably was it, whether it was going to be the Baptists or the Anglicans or whoever, they didn't want one particular denomination to come in and rule. So what are your thoughts about that? No, I think that's, you're, you're right to put your finger on that. That's one of the really interesting aspects of the, the kind of the constitution and what's different between the new federal government and the state governments. Because, you know, some of those state governments, if you think about it, you know, a lot of the colonists when they came to America were fleeing religious persecution. And, you know, there's kind of two reactions when you're fleeing religious persecution. You can either say, boy, you know, it was terrible. I, I'm, I was Catholic and I was in Anglican England and they repressed me. And so you get to a new world and you can either do one of two things. You can say, we never want that to happen to anyone again. 
So we're going to have real religious toleration. Or you can say, well, that was terrible. Now we have our own colony where we're in charge. So we're going to have our own Catholic colony. Um, so we'll do the same thing to the Protestants here that they did to us back there. And you kind of have those two impulses in the colonies where some are founded really with a kind of official religion of their own, and some are founded with more religious toleration. And I think what the framers realized is that for the new federal government, uh, they wanted two things. They did want religious toleration. And part of that was, I think, you know, when you see this in the First Amendment, when, you know, probably another, another topic, but you, when you see it in the First Amendment and the free exercise clause and the rest. So I think the framers genuinely wanted religious toleration, but I also think they were practical. And they realized that they had a couple of colonies or a couple of states rather that cared deeply about their own official religion. And they couldn't impose one religion on all of the states. And so the best way to have everybody get along was to say in the federal government, we are not gonna have any religious tests. We're not gonna have any one religion for the new federal government. And I think you see that reinforced in the establishment clause in the first amendment. I think that's where history is so important because in, in, in a way, and knowledge is important. People think, no, no religion, no religion in government, no religion, you know, the, you, you can't. And, and, I, and when I say that you don't want bishops in the government telling everybody what to do, but I mean, it seems like there's, we've gone the, the full other side where people say, no religion, no God, no religion, no God. That's not at all really what they were saying. They were saying, look, and I think it was Maryland was sort of a Catholic exactly. area, you know? And then, and then Pennsylvania was more open-minded. I think Massachusetts was Anglican. Really their thinking was that since every state, it's not that we don't want God, but since every state has their own sort of unique, we, we don't, how do we do that in a federal government? We can't. So they were, that's really more what they were thinking than no God, which is certainly the, the trend today. No, I think that's right. And, you know, this really has some kind of contemporary relevance for what's going on in the Supreme Court right now, because Justice Thomas, who's probably the justice on the court, who's kind of most willing to go back to kind of first principles, sort of doesn't care. Yeah, okay, there've been a bunch of decisions about in this area, but if they're all wrong, I don't care that much. I want to I go back to the beginning. And he's argued pretty forcefully that the whole idea that like the establishment clause in the first amendment is really, it's, it's, it's kind of like just a, a provision, almost like a state's right provision. And it really wasn't meant to um, sort of directly sort of restrict the state governments. And it was only designed to be an assurance to the states to kind of back up the, the you know, article six to kind of tell the states, look, you know, you can have a state religion if you want. We're not going to say no religious tests for state officers, but we're just going to say in the federal government, we're not going to have that kind of religion. So as a result, Justice Thomas has said, if you are coming to the court and your argument is that a state has violated the establishment clause because let's say it's allowed, uh, you know, a cross on state property or something, he's not going to vote for you because he doesn't think that the establishment clause even restricts the state governments. Now, so far, that's a view that- yeah, Explain to our listener, explain to our, list, our young listeners the Establishment Clause. Sure, so the Establishment Clause is part of the First Amendment, and it says that you know, the, the, the Congress, the federal government, uh, shall not establish religion. And it's, I mean, I'll, I'll read you the clause just so, you know, yeah, I always gotta be careful with the Constitution because at least the justices care about every last word. So I don't, I don't want to mislead you. So here's what it says. Um, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. So that's what it says. So the, the First Amendment itself as written is specific to Congress, the new federal Congress. Now, I don't want to get like too far afield here, but the Supreme Court has long, um, at least for 50 years, and with respect to the religion clauses, probably for 100 years, has interpreted most of the provisions of the Bill of Rights, of which the First Amendment is the first, to apply against state governments as well. So most of the constitutional amendments were originally written in terms of what the federal government can't do to the citizens. 
but the Supreme Court decided we're going to extend those same protections to the states. So you, this, if, if, if Congress, you know, First Amendment free speech protection, one everybody knows, I think, Congress shall pass no law abridging speech. Well, the Supreme Court, like about 100 years ago, said that applies to state legislatures too. So that's the dominant view of most of the constitutional provisions. And that's why Justice Thomas is kind of unique in saying that the Establishment Clause only restricts the federal government, not the states. But he does have kind of more history on his side with respect to the Establishment Clause than with respect to these other provisions because of some of the things that we were talking about. And I really think if you, if you look carefully at the text of Article 6, it is pretty interesting that essentially in the same clause, this is the third clause of Article 6, the framers tell state officers that they have to take an oath to the new federal constitution. And then the last sentence in the clause, they say, uh, but no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. So they have a clause where the first part of it applies to both state government officials and federal government officials. But when it comes to no religious test, it applies only to the new federal government. So I think that- mm, So that's, know, where just, that's where Justice Thomas gets it then. He exactly, it's a big that, part. That, that's a, interesting. Yeah, it's that's a big part of where he gets it, that and mm, the history. So that, that's where he gets it. Yeah. So, so he, he says, it says no religious test and uh, that, that's really fascinating. So in other words, all the amendments to the constitution apply to states too, except religion. Yes. And it, like I said, it gets complicated because the basic way that, I mean, you know, the, the, the justices on the Supreme Court didn't just say, hey, wouldn't it be great if all of these Bill of Rights provisions that as written apply only to the federal government applied to the states? They've done it through a doctrine, a legal doctrine that they call incorporation. And what they've done is the 14th Amendment which was enacted right mm -hmm. after the Civil War and as part of the Reconstruction, it does prohibit the states from doing things. It's, it's written differently from the Bill of Rights, and it basically says no state shall, do, shall deny equal protection or shall deny due process. And what the justices have done over the years is say, well, what do we mean by due process? I mean, is that just anything under the sun? And they've essentially said, well, we think most of the guarantees of the Bill of Rights are part of that due process protection. So they, they kind of incorporate the first eight amendments through the 14th Amendment, but it's a tricky enough move <laughs> that it's easy for a justice to say, well, maybe I'm on board that for, you know, the double jeopardy clause, um, but I'm not on board that for uh, the establishment clause or, you know, again, I don't want to get too complicated, but like no justice thinks that the civil jury trial right, which is protected in the federal constitution applies to the states. So, so there is, there's, there's, there's kind of playing the joints in the doctrine that allows somebody like Justice Thomas to say, I'm not going to, you know, I don't, I don't see it with respect to the establishment clause. Um, so anyways, that takes us a little far, that, far that field, is but that is really, 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 really interesting. Really interesting. Okay, um, I, I could talk to you all day, but I have to share. I have to share with Lisa and Jeanette. So Lisa and Jeanette, who want, who want to go next? Who, who would like to ask a question next? Raise your hand fast. Okay, Lisa. Lisa won, Jeanette. <laughs> um, real quick, I did want to clarify. There were eight attempts to uh, grant temporary power or amend articles of confederation and none of them were successful so you were correct on that um there are eight attempts to what amend the articles of confederation which was what he was saying took the unanimous vote okay um, okay over and, the and none of, of them were years none yeah. of them were successful okay including right. granting them temporary power but not amending the actual um so i had a question from kathy um she wanted to know, um, she wanted to ask about the relationship between the Supremacy Clause and the Tenth Amendment. So does the Supremacy Clause include federal laws that are not directly enumerated powers of Congress or 
um, basically like what's that relationship between the Tenth Amendment, which says everything not given to the federal government belongs to the states? Um, no, it's a great question. So um, Kathy is to be commended for asking such a great question. Um, and I, I, I think the answer is in the text of the Article 6 and just requires kind of a careful reading because what the Supremacy Clause says, the first part of it says, this Constitution and the laws of the United States, which basically means laws passed by Congress, um, but then it says, the Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof. So made in pursuance thereof, I think referring back to the Constitution. Um, and all treaties shall be the supreme law of the land. And so the view that has certainly prevailed um, from the very beginning is that laws passed by Congress will trump state laws, will take supremacy over state laws as long as they were validly enacted, as long as they were enacted in pursuance of the Constitution, not in violation of the Constitution. So to answer Kathy's question really specifically, if Congress passes a law that purports to displace any contrary state law, but the congressional law is in excess of Congress's authority, either because they just lack the power to do it at all, or because it runs against some doctrine the Supreme Court has developed under the 10th Amendment, um, which reserves powers to the state. If, if the law is invalid, if the federal law is invalid for either of those reasons, then it doesn't displace anything. It doesn't have any effect whatsoever. And so kind of if you're thinking about a federal law that conflicts with a state law, maybe the first question you ask is, is it even a valid federal law to start with? I mean, did Congress have the authority to do that? And then the second part of the analysis would then be, okay, if Congress has the authority to do it, is there really a conflict? Is there a way to reconcile the laws? And if there's not, and Congress had the authority to pass the law, then the law takes precedence. So there's an old, old Supreme Court case called Coyle against Oklahoma, involved a federal statute that tried to tell Oklahoma where it should locate its own state capital. And the court basically said, no, come on, federal Congress, you're just, you're, you're messing with something that really belongs to Oklahoma. You can do a lot, federal government, but you can't tell Oklahoma where to put its state capital. Or there's a more recent case called Prince, and P-R-I-N-T-Z, not P-R-I-N-C-E, so Prince. But the Prince case um, was an effort by Congress to basically say, we're gonna pass this new federal law that requires people to do background checks on firearms, and we don't really have enough kind of federal officials to enforce this law. So we're gonna make state officials essentially oversee the process in its implementation phase. And the Supreme Court said under the 10th Amendment, no, you can't do that. You, you can tell, in, in, you can enact a federal law and you can tell the federal officers to go execute it, but you can't tell like the state sheriffs what they should be doing between nine to five, that's, that's overstepping your bounds. So even in those cases, the law as written would have displaced contrary state law. The Supreme Court said, no, that's the, the law is invalid in the first instance. Um, I, I don't know if you have a follow-up question, Lisa, I did, but as you say this, I think that, that in a way they put, um, the Tenth Amendment to prevent the government from getting too big, but in the way you just describe it, it, there's something you said earlier, not your examples, because they did preserve the rights of the states. But in my mind, I'm just thinking, ironically, what they didn't want to happen has happened, is that the federal government is now huge and overbearing to the states with all kinds of regulations and mandates. So it's not really working, I think, what they intended the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, or especially the Tenth Amendment to be, or whichever it is. One state and one's a person. Yeah, no, the t right. 
so look, it's a fair criticism. Um, and, you know, and I'm not sure you necessarily should blame the Tenth Amendment because, you know, one of the things that is, appears in a number of cases about the Tenth Amendment is that the Tenth Amendment sort of states a truism. Because what the Tenth Amendment sort of says is all the powers that aren't granted to the new federal government are reserved to the states. And in other words, it's obvious. That's just obvious is what you're saying when you say a truism. Well, yeah, it's a truism. It's, and, and, and the reason it's a truism is this. Like what, what makes, and, and I think all of the framers thought this, what makes the federal government sort of different from your typical state government is the, the framers didn't say the federal government gets to do everything unless it violates one of the provisions in the Bill of Rights. That's not the way they thought about it. There's like a fancy term that lawyers use to talk about plenary power, which plenary just means everything. So states, state governments, you know, start with the idea that unless they're constrained by their state constitution, they sort of have plenary power, or sometimes it's called police power. So they can regulate everything. They can tell you that, you know, you can't have um, a structure more than 20 feet high. Um, and unless that violates some particular constitutional provision, that's, they can do that. Whereas the federal government was supposed to be a, a government only of limited and enumerated powers. So the idea was, unless somewhere in the constitution, you can point to where the federal government was given the power to do something, they can't do it. So if the federal government tells me that I can't build my house more than 20 feet high, I would say, wait a second, that's no business of the federal government. And where, you know, where in the Constitution is your power to tell me that? Now, today, somebody might say, well, Congress can do that under the commerce power. And that's because over a bunch of Supreme Court decisions, they've interpreted the commerce power pretty darn broadly. So anything that sort of affects interstate commerce um, you know, the, the courts will be pretty deferential to the federal, to the federal government. So I think the real problem is not that the 10th Amendment didn't do its job, but that the Supreme Court has interpreted those limited and enumerated powers to not be all that limited. And then if you want to think about like for better or for worse, and you can debate this, but if you want to point to sort of why it is that the federal government is as powerful as it is today. I mean, I would say, don't, don't blame the 10th Amendment. Take a look at the 16th Amendment and the 17th Amendments. Because the 16th Amendment gave the federal government a power that the framers didn't give it, which is the power to levy an income tax. And once you let the federal government impose an income tax, it can raise all sorts of money to do all sorts of things that I don't think the framers would have really been able to easily conceptualize. And then the 17th Amendment eliminated the, uh, sort of guaranteed the direct election of senators. And that sounds great. Everybody likes being able to vote. Everybody likes being able to vote for all the people that represent them. But the framers thought that you get to directly elect your representatives for the House of Representatives, but they thought that the way that most senators would be chosen is by the state legislatures. And they thought that that would be a real limit on the growth of the federal government because you'd sort of have half the Congress that was really looking out for the interests of states in a very distinct way because they owed their election to the state legislatures. And when you take that away, again, with the best of intentions, but if you take that away, it does change the dynamic. And now you have senators that instead of thinking, boy, I better look out for states' rights here or I'm going to lose my job. Um, you know, you have senators that start thinking, boy, I better have something to show my constituents that I did while I was in the Senate for six years. And the best way to do that is to pass some new laws. So you really do kind of change the incentives. And I'm not trying to argue that the 17th Amendment was a bad idea. 
I mean, you know, you can debate it back and forth. I'm just saying, if you think about kind of the structural reasons that the, that the, that the, that the Constitution has a lot more power in the central government today than in 1789, part of it is, you know, the framers in their wisdom allowed it to be amended a lot easier than the Articles of Confederation. And some of those amendments have changed the dynamic. Because it doesn't have to be unanimous between the states? Is that what you're saying? No, no I'm saying they, the, the framers, I, I'm saying two things. I'm saying the framers thought that the Constitution should be hard to amend, but still easier to amend than the Articles of Confederation, which is basically impossible. That's the problem, you say? No, I'm not saying it's the problem. problem. I'm just saying that, but, mm -hmm. but, but then when you have those Makes amendments, sense. like the 16th Amendment and the 17th Amendment, it does shift the power around. It's not... You know, I've got a, I've got a funny story. My, my father was a graduate of West Point, you know, the United States Military Academy at West Point. So he was there 53 to 57, he played football, 53, 54, 55. Well, 54, 55, 56, you know, 57, he graduated. And um, so I, he ended, ended up joining the Air Force because it was Air Force Army back then. And I was raised with the jets flying over my, my head. You know, my dad was one of the first to fly twice the speed of sound and all this. And so he was, he didn't, we didn't talk politics at the table much or anything, but I remember I was in third grade and I looked up at my father and said, dad, if our founding fathers were to come back today, what would they be most disappointed about? And I don't know what third grader asked that question. You know, I guess I was meant to do this show. Uh, or this foundation, <laughs> but, but, but what my father, you know what my father said, General Clement? What did he say? He's a very quiet spoken, he was a very quiet spoken man, man, a few words. So he looked down at me and said, taxes. <laughs> so well, he agrees with you. Yeah, no, and, and, and you know, if, <laughs> if, if you think, I mean, you know, if, if, you, if you think about our constitution, you know, the framers came up with the basic plan and then there was the Bill of Rights kind of immediately. And then there really were two other big periods where people kind of changed the Constitution. And one is the Reconstruction Amendments. So that's the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. They came all together. And you know, you think about it, it's pretty wild, right? I mean, you had 10 amendments right away. You had like another two, just two, until the Civil War. And then you have three, like, right in a row, 13, 14, 15. And then nobody messes with the Constitution again for about 50 years. And then you have another kind of, you know, three or four right in a row. You have the, you have the 16th Amendment allowing for the income tax. You have the 17th Amendment allowing for the direct election of senators. You have the 18th Amendment, which gives the states, the, which, which prohibits the sale of alcohol. Um, you have the 19th Amendment that extends the vote to women. Um, and then eventually, you know, I guess what we can say is you can, you know, I think, you know, those, those amendments were grouped together. They're kind of the progressive era amendments. And, you know, they're very important. Obviously, extending suffrage to women is a hugely important thing. And nobody thinks that wasn't the right thing to do. Um, the 18th Amendment with prohibition I think everyone agrees was a bad idea. That's why the 21st Amendment repealed the 18th Amendment, the only thing in our Constitution that did that. Um, you know, and the 16th and the 17th were very transformative amendments. And you know, they really, I think, are a big part of why we have kind of the robust yep. federal government that we have. And, and it's interesting, too, that you, and I'm going to go to Jeanette. It's interesting, too, that we have the, we only have 10 minutes left, the, the Commerce Clause because what I think is the, one of the, another reason that the government is, the federal government is so big is because they, they entice the states with money. You know, they like, we'll give you money if you do this. So we, and then we have power over you. And that's what, that's money. When someone gives you money, they have power over you. And that's like a whole nother discussion. Um, back to the supremacy clause. With regard to the justices that are sitting on the court these days, um, do you think they're more or less in agreement with the, the current breakdown of the court that we have right now? Do you think that they view the supremacy clause, the, supremacy clause the same or, I, I mean, how far apart are our justices with regard to this, do you think? So I think it's really interesting because I think that 
some of the newest justices, you know, probably, you know, sort of maybe have slightly different perspectives on this. And it's not one where it easily breaks down on kind of left right bases. And probably the best example of that is, you know, President Trump has appointed two justices to the Supreme Court and, you know, Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh. And I'm not sure they actually agree on, you know, the supremacy clause. I think that Justice Kavanaugh probably um, is more likely to find federal law to preempt state law. And I think Justice Gorsuch is a little more likely to think, boy, Congress has got to be super clear um, about, you know, about its intent to preempt state law before state law gives way. And so it, it'll depend a little bit on the context, but it is a complicated uh, question. And it's not one where you can just say, oh, okay, Justice so-and-so is kind of a liberal, so I know they're going to be sort of anti-supremacy clause or pro-supremacy clause. Mm -hmm. And part of, the, part of the tricky thing comes down to something I alluded to before, which is in the context of the supremacy clause, the hard question often comes down to, okay, it's easy enough to say that when there's a conflict between state law and federal law, that federal law takes precedence. But it's a lot more debatable whether there's a conflict. I mean, you know, if, you know, just for instance, if federal law says that you have to have um, a, let's say, you know, a, a trailer, um, you know, to, in order to be on the interstate has to be at least 20 feet long, Mm -hmm. And the state government says, well, it has to be 25 feet long. Is there a conflict? I mean, it depends. The federal government seems to say, if you have something that's 22 feet, that's okay. And the state government says, no, it has to be 25. So you could say that's a conflict. On the other hand, you could say, well, as long as you're 25 or 26 feet long, you don't have to worry, you satisfy both laws. Right. So there's not really a conflict. And those are the kind of yeah. issues that divide the court when they're interpreting the supremacy clause. Yeah, it's an interesting time in history. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is. And I, but I think it's, you know, honestly, I think for the court, it's healthy if justices disagree about things like that. Oh, 100%. I agree. Because I think too many people see the justices kind of dividing over things that seem right left. And it seems like, okay, yeah, I know, like that justice was appointed by a Republican. So he's mm -hmm. going to be pro this or anti this. And I think it's healthy, frankly, for there to be important constitutional questions where, you know, it doesn't matter who appointed the justice and even justices appointed by the same president disagree. I think all of that shows that what the justices are doing is something that's not just kind of politics, they're interpreting the constitution. And as a, as a teacher and as a mother, um, I think it's hopeful for our younger generation to see that they don't necessarily see eye to eye on everything and they've been appointed by the same. And it gives, it gives our younger people hope. Like if they can agree to disagree, so can we. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's right. I think that's Thank right. You. I think that's hugely important. Thank you for answering that. Uh, Janina, I can, I can just follow up on one thing that you said um, uh, that, uh -huh. that interested me, because you're right. One of, the, one of the big tools the federal government has used in order to get the states to do what they want is you know, putting conditions on funding and saying, well, you know, we'll give you this money if you do this. And I, 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 I do have to say, though, I think that does get back to the 16th Amendment, because why does the federal government have all this money that it can use to induce the state governments to do what they want. It's because they can tax the people directly. And under the constitution that the framers wrote, like the federal government, its principal source of revenue was gonna be like export duties and import duties because they couldn't directly tax the people. And that's a huge check on how big the federal government can get. And it totally eliminates this problem. You know, the only money the federal government has is the money that they can raise through like tariffs and duties. They're gonna just use all that money to buy, you know, planes for your grandfather to fly. They're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna, like they're, they're gonna have all that money. They're gonna need it for what they need. They're not gonna have a bunch of extra money they can just create to use to sort of, you know, kind of bribe for lack of a, a more polite term, the states to do what they want them to do.
So just wrote that word down. Right. Yeah, there you go. Right. Yeah. No, but, <laughs> but you know, it, it does. Once you give the federal government the power to directly tax people in the states, it's a huge change in the relationship between the federal governments and the state governments. And I think it's kind of underappreciated what a big deal uh, the 16th Amendment was and how, you know, like I said, how right your grandfather was. Yeah. So my dad, my dad was oh, right sorry. on. My yeah, dad was dad, right sorry, on the money. Sorry. Yeah, let's get the generation <laughs> here, but your dad, yeah, no, and it's, and, yeah. and he was absolutely right. He was absolutely right. That's really, that's really interesting, because I'm, 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 and we need to let you go now. I'm real, I, I'm intrigued um, and worried about the power of the federal government with, with the whole bribe of the money situation and how they get involved in the business, and, and then, then, then we're beholden to them. But it's fascinating what you said, is where do they get the money in the first place? They get it from us. Um, and that goes back to the Declaration of Independence, which says, you know, the government should govern to the consent of the people. But the minute that we started letting them tax us, we lost our, we lost our power. Yeah, no. I, and, you know, I, I mean, I had a great exchange with Justice Kagan in, the, in, in a Supreme Court case about the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act, and particularly the provision that involved giving the states money to amend their, their Medicaid. And, she, you know, she asked me effectively, you know, well, why is this so coercive? Like, you know, if, if somebody just wants to give you money, like what, what's the problem? And, and part of my answer was, well, well where, did, where did they get the money? If they just picked pick my pocket and took my wallet and said, here, here's money, that, that's not very attractive to me because they've taken the money in the first instance. And that's kind of the power that the 16th Amendment gave the federal government. And, you know, it, it sort of really displaces the states because, you know, because of the supremacy clause, like nobody doubts the federal government gets to take its taxes first. And if the federal government's taking, you know, like, you know, I think the, the highest marginal tax rate these days is like, I don't know, somewhere around 35 or 40%. But if the federal government takes 35 or 40% of somebody's income, that only leaves 60% for the state to tax. I mean, so it really kind of changes the dynamic. Oh, oh, interesting. So they only tax you, the states can only tax you the net of what the government is taking? Well, it, it, even if they want to tax you on your gross income, they still practically, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, it'd be interesting. And hopefully we never know the answer to what happens if the federal government tries to tax you at a 60% rate and the state tries to tax you at a 45% rate. So collectively, you have to pay more taxes than you made income. I mean, you know, I'm just saying more practically, not not like not doctrinally. If the federal government takes its share, as a practical matter, the states are limited. Whereas in the framers' design, it was you know really much more the states that would be the print. If anybody had a big income tax, it would be the states, and there would be limits on what they could do. In part because people could move and businesses could decide oh, I'm not going to relocate there, but you give the federal government the power to take all that money directly from the people, and it really puts the state governments in a much more subordinate position. Mm -hmm. Well, up to people, too, because now we're going to tell you what to do with the money that we just took from you. Yeah, and I think, again, part of the by, framers... By, by bribing and the way they do it. Yeah. yeah, and I think part of the framers' design was to make the government that would be the principal direct taxer of the people, closer to the people and more responsive to the people. So if the state, if, you know, and, and again, you know, the, the federal government certainly had the authority to raise revenue, but it wasn't gonna be through direct taxes. And the Supreme Court mm -hmm. held that an income tax is a direct tax, so it's impermissible. Um, and so, you know, the, the federal governments, I think thought that the federal government would have a lot less money wouldn't have money around to put these conditions on the states and generally, by not having that revenue source, it would keep the federal government within certain boundaries of size. So again, and then the 10th amendment actually works. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. basically right. <laughs> to come but, full circle, the 10th right. amendment works, but with the whole set, the 16th amendment or, you know, it changed everything. Yeah. Fascinating. This has been great. Wow. I'm sitting here thinking pleasure. maybe I should go to law school. Uh, this is all so interesting. I don't know. I don't know if you're 57 if you decide to go to law school or not, though. I think Never too late. late. Never too late. A little late. A little late in the game. No, I don't think I, so. I would be a 
90 year old okay let me like tell you what you're gonna do today <laughs> let me give you my legal advice now what was it i just said <laughs> so. Oh, good. Okay. Well, you're brilliant. You're wonderful. Thank you for your time. It was an honor for us to have you be with us. And thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. And thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Jeanette. And thank you, General Clement. Now, my pleasure. Great to be with you.